The risks of extremism and ideology have presented themselves countless times throughout history. In today's video, I'm going to give the component of dehumanization a look as we explore the concept and act of genocide as it relates to ideology. To begin, a quick look at ideology as it relates to this video. One often can describe ideology as a lens of which one can view the world through. By this analogy, the impact ideology has on a person becomes evident. Hence, one can have their world perceived differently. It becomes necessary to state that because of this, the rationalization process is affected. Humans require data to interpret and conclude on matters consciously. Thus, the injection of bias results in a skewed conclusion as a result of it changing the subjectivity of the information. Humans as a species are notable for our ability to rationalize issues and from that rationalization draw conclusions. The perception of irrational behavior in humans consciously, because of this, could, for this reason, be construed as the result of observational bias. So how does this relate to genocide? Firstly, all genocides in history result from ideology, and ideology can be found in all aspects of social life. Secondly, ideology is responsible for conveying thoughts, ideas, and values to the individual. As such, it can be simply stated that ideology is capable of constructing the framework in which genocide can be made legitimate and rational. This is achieved through the culture, through the culture, or the culture, as Newman explains. The actions of the individual are simply not just the functions of personality types or psychological predispositions. Rather, they are also a reflection of the shared cultural expectations. Culture provides us with information about which of these actions are preferred, accepted, disapproved, or unthinkable at a given time. Newman, 1997. In doing this, the individual can be made susceptible to the risk of dehumanization. From this, cognitive dissonance is easier to create because emotions can be redirected from empathy to the support of the cause. It is essential now to indicate that it is easy to simply brush off individuals who commit acts of genocide as insane and monsters. Such accusations, though, find little basis in reality. This is supported by the following quote. The evidence indicates that most genocidal perpetrators participate because they have been convinced that their deadly work is difficult but necessary duty for their race, tribe, ethnic group, and or nationality. Waller, 2002. For this reason, individuals executing the act of genocide are in fact rather rational and often disturbed and repulsed by their actions. This is demonstrated well in the words of one Nazi. The sight of the dead, including women and children, is not very cheering, but we are fighting this war for the survival or non-survival of our people. My comrades are literally fighting for our existence of our people. Klee, Dresden, Reese, 1988. However, as it is demonstrated in the quote, such hints at empathy and morality are managed by the notion that committing such atrocities is in some sense a necessary evil. To note, such actions are often explained as defense as the perpetrators truly believe that they are in fact the ones in danger and thus are either retaliating or defending against the enemy. Or, as one perpetrator of the Rwandan genocide puts it, I defended the members of my tribe against the Tutsi. Pruner, 1995. To revert back to the process of dehumanization, such a process is not immediate. The distancing of empathy is created over time through the creation of stereotypes and in particular the accusations of crimes and misdeeds of the past being perpetrated by the targeted groups. And this is very nicely encapsulated by the following quote. Strip the victims of their humanity and thus make them seem to stand apart from humanity which to the perpetrators meant that the ordinary moral norms did not apply to them. Smuller's 1996. In our modern political atmosphere, I believe that utilizing a case study from Serbia will prove to be most effective at conveying my points. On the 15th of June, 1389, the Ottoman Empire and various Serbian princes fought on the field of battle. 
The war was an epic defeat for the Serbian populace, who now found themselves under new management. However, the fight was not the end, to say the least. Jim Judah, Tim Judas asserts the following about the battle. Its real, lasting legacy lay in the myths and legends which came to be woven around it, enabling it to shape the nation's historical and national consciousness. Judea, 1997. Lewis Sell suggests that all nations shape their image of themselves, at least in part on myth. For Serbia, the central myth of one heroic struggle, often against hopeless odds, followed by betrayal and defeat, but also, eventually, rebirth and triumph. Like all national myths, the Serbian picture contains many exaggerations and downright falsehoods. Sell, 2002. Later, in the early 1990s, however, the Serbians would get their revenge by facilitating an ethnic cleansing against Muslims and Croats, which was supported and legitimized by Serb propaganda that constantly played upon the theme of Serb victimizations, Serb victimization at the hands of the Ottoman Turks in 1389 and by the Croats during World War II. Funnily enough, Serbians had actually fought on both sides during the war in 1389 which was conveniently neglected, and thus made such propaganda factually inaccurate. This also seeks to further demonstrate that dehumanization and genocide are often rooted in manipulated half-truths rather than fact. In conclusion, it is evident that over time the act of dehumanization by ideology is prone to the possibility of committing crimes against humanity. From this, it is essential to conclude that in every respect, one must be vigilant in ensuring dehumanization is identified and monitored. This becomes particularly applicable in the modern context, with the rise of extremism and ideology, with a particular focus on far-left factions, who are notable in their bigotry and dehumanization in the name of claimed past dehumanization. In the words of, and I'm probably going to butcher this, Ennio Faliano, in Italy, there are two types of fascists, fascists and anti-fascists. Thank you for listening to this short info video. I hope you actually enjoyed it, and I did insert some clips this time. So that's always a bonus um, to hopefully give you some stuff to actually watch while you're supposed to be watching a video. Um, and as always, thanks again, and I hope you really found this an educational use of your time. And if you like what I do, feel free to like and subscribe. If not, feel free to leave me on a, a nice comment down below or message me directly on how you think I could improve. And I'm going to repeat myself again. Thank you very much for watching, and have a wonderful night, day, evening, morning, whatever it happens to be, wherever you are. And uh, bye.